Today's episode of the WAC Podcast is brought to you by Hercules Tires, the official tire of the Western Athletic Conference. Now here are your hosts, Eric Danner and Rachel Vigil. Welcome back to the WAC Podcast, Eric Danner and Rachel Vigil. We are now joined by Nikki Jackson, one of the all-time great men's soccer players in WAC history. Nikki, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you guys doing? I'm doing well. Rach, you're doing good? I'm doing well. I'm happy that you're on with us. Yeah. Uh, hey, I'm happy to be here. Now, Nikki, we're celebrating uh, WAC men's soccer this week as we're, you know, developing some content as we don't currently have any uh, games going on. And we're looking yeah. back at the last 10 years in WAC men's soccer and uh, came out with the top goal scorers of the past decade. And you're number two on the list in the WAC. Only Danny Mazowski got you. Mm-hmm. So how, how do you feel about that? You would you? I, I imagine you want to be number one, but you got to be yeah. pretty happy about number two. No, it's crazy because me and Danny, we actually have a pretty good relationship. So, like, throughout the years of us playing against each other, we always kind of joked around and kind of played with each other. And, like, we were super competitive on the field, but off the field, we were great friends. So, it's kind of cool for us to, like, being in the same, like, generation of uh, WAC soccer kind of top the list. So, it's just an honor for sure. 40 goals in your career over at GCU. Is there one that really just sticks out for you? Oh, wow. Um... I would have to say probably one of my favorite goals I've ever scored was probably against Portland, my diving header. I think that was my sophomore year, maybe junior year. And then uh, one of my favorite games, but goals uh, also was against UCF, which was awesome as well. Now, you had a chance. I mean, uh, GCU was still pretty new to Division I when, when you went there. Mm. The, the crowd that you would get at those GCU games when you'd score a goal – did you expect that what that atmosphere that it would be like in Phoenix uh, for Division One men's soccer? Um, well, it's it's hard to say. Like I think uh, Brian Mueller did a really good job, and Mike Blott did a really good job with uh, promoting men's soccer in Arizona with GCU, uh, especially with Shells coming in and getting uh, a very good hype coming his way. I think um, I didn't expect what we had, but I was very grateful that we had it. You know. And I think it's only been building more and more since uh, we've gotten that stadium. So it was definitely a blessing to be able to play uh, in front of thousands of fans almost every game. So it was really cool. A great, a great, uh, way easier transition going into pros for sure. How did Shellis Heinemann, the head coach over at GCU, how did he help you transition to becoming a pro soccer player? Um, yeah, Shellis is a, a great coach, all time, one of the all time winning coaches in college soccer, I believe. Um, but I think with him being coming from FC Dallas and already been at that level, he kind of, he, he stayed true to his level of professionalism. He he didn't, he didn't drop it down to college, you know, he kept it very professional. So bringing a professional coach to the college soccer, at least with GCU, he kept that same, same mentality. So it made it a lot easier transitioning because I knew what kind of coaching I'm going to be getting, what kind of pace that the coaches are going to want from me going into the pros. So she was, uh, played a huge role in my transition from college to professional. We're talking with Nikki Jackson, former GCU grade. And Nikki, I believe Shellis became the coach while you were there. Is that correct? Yes, he came. Uh, he he uh, got hired my end of my freshman year. So I didn't have my first true season with him until my sophomore year. Yes. Yeah, what was that transition like for you? Obviously, if he didn't recruit you, yeah. did you – it maybe have some questions whether or not you should stay there. And obviously it worked out great, but uh, yeah. was there any trepidation uh, playing for Shellis? Um, no, no, I, I don't think so. I think uh, I actually uh, was able to sit down with Mike Blatt, uh and kind of speak to him once we hired him and stuff and, uh, and speak with Shellis as well. And we kind of sat down and Shellis believed in me. He kind of knew my background as well. And so um, having Shellis come in, I think, when I heard he played for FC, like he coached FC Dallas, that kind of got me more excited, you know, because then I kind of have a pathway to go through. So, I mean, obviously I didn't go to Dallas, but uh, it definitely got me excited for the future because I had a guy with a lot of strings and connections in the professional world. So it got me super excited. Then in 2018, you get drafted in the MLS Super Draft to the Colorado Rapids. I know you hurt your ACL. So how is that recovery going? Um, It was, it's crazy because like, Obviously, no one wants to get hurt, but, like, when I was telling some of my teams, I was like, 
if there was a season to get injured, it would be right now. You know, we, we, we weren't doing anything for about four months. But, I mean, at the beginning, it was, a little, it was a little harder because I wasn't able to get into PT as much as I should have. But, I mean, uh, I have my whole little workout station here. They set up for me the Rapids in my apartment. So, uh, that was a lot. That was, that was very helpful. So, for the very beginning, it was a little tough. But, I mean, we stayed on track and we didn't, we didn't, we didn't uh, regress too much. But now that we're, we're, we're gone and everything's back, almost back to normal, I'm able to get in the stadium almost every day now. So uh, getting to work in. So it's, it's going really good now. I'm not having, I'm not having any trouble now. I'm, I'm really progressing. I'm getting there. I'm really close. Now, Nikki, you had the surgery right before the pandemic hit. So I imagine you were probably in the hospital when, what, around that March 11th, 12th, kind of when everything yeah. started shutting down. What, what was sure. that like for you being in the hospital at that point? It was crazy because um, we were, uh, my girlfriend, my family wanted to come, but at the time the traveling was kind of restricted. So they, they live in Atlanta. So they weren't really able to come. So I really had my girlfriend. I was kind of scared that they weren't even going to allow her to come in. But luckily they uh, allowed my girlfriend to come in and kind of help me and get me through the whole process and stuff. But once we uh, got settled, it was just like quarantine, like right after an injury. It was crazy. But, uh, it was good, though, because the first, like, two weeks, I wasn't even able to really do much. So the quarantine kind of worked in my favor because, like, I was just relaxing and just chilling and stuff. So, What is that rehab process like? You said first two weeks you weren't really doing anything. After that, was it little to, like, little movement? And then you were able to kind of start walking and then eventually yeah. start running? Yeah, it definitely uh, because after, you, uh, after surgery, you have a lot of swelling and stitches are still in. So they uh, – the process is a little slower because you want to wait before you get started. You want to make sure you get the swelling down a little bit. So for, for first week, week and a half, we didn't do too much. And then we slowly gradually started like doing massage therapy and stuff like that. And then transition to like small movements and small little workouts. And then just kept gradually uh, moving forward. Had you had an injury like this before, Nikki? Uh, is this your first ACL? And when it, when it happened, did you know it was, was an ACL? Um, yeah, so yeah, this is my first injury. The the worst thing I've ever done is strain a hamstring uh, next to this. But uh, yeah, it happened uh, with the switchbacks, actually. It was like right when I got loaned out for preseason, I was in Utah. And uh, when, when it happened, I went down and I was on the ground for like a few seconds. It wasn't very painful, but uh, I do have a high pain tolerance though. So I think that's probably why I didn't really feel much. And then once I kind of got up, I was actually ready to go back on the field. Like I jogged back on the field, but I think that's more drilling than anything. And my trainer was like, no, you're done, you're done. And then uh, we didn't know for sure until I got my MRI. But after like the second day I did it, it was just swelled up like a balloon. And I was like, okay, yeah, there's something going on. But uh, luckily I had a great doctor, Dr. Frank, uh, performed surgery on me and she did a great job. And uh, her team really worked well on me. And, uh, I'm, I'm almost there now, so I'm ready to go. What immediately went through your head as soon as you heard that you had torn your ACL? Oh, wow. Um, that's a good question. Uh, first thoughts. Um, I don't know. I wasn't like – mentally, I'm a very strong person, so it wasn't really more so my career is over this, that. But it's just kind of like, let's get it going. You know, let's, 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 let's get the surgery done. Let's get rehab going and let's get back out there as soon as I can, you know, kind of mindset, kind of just ready to ready to get back, you know. So it was more so just let's get the surgery on, let's get rehab going, and let's get me back by the end of the year. So now you mentioned you were with the Colorado Springs switchbacks when that happened. And uh, for those who don't know, with the uh, the Rapids, with the MLS, so I believe the Rapids have a, uh, a an agreement with the switchbacks where it's uh, basically almost like a minor league team yeah. for them where, where players can go back and forth. Mm -hmm. What has that process been like for you? Because I know you've been back and forth a few times between the Rapids and the USL yeah. in terms of, you know, just knowing where you're going to be each year. Um, yeah, so they do a good job with the housing. That's not more the problem. It's more so, uh, I think for players at least, you got to stay mentally intact. And so whoever you're playing for, make sure you're there and you're aware. But uh, – I think with the switchbacks and the Rapids, what they have is a great uh, relationship. Alan Coach, the head coach, um, uh, he sat me down as soon as he heard he was going to get me. We had an hour-long discussion. He told me what he wanted for me. 
how much he loved wanted me to play for them and stuff like that. So me and Alan have a great relationship. So he's actually uh, reached out to me about two weeks ago. Kind of we kind of kept caught up about my rehab and everything. So I think uh, definitely definitely the players that go down there, the switchbacks uh, really make you feel like a, as you're a player, you're not just like a loney, you know, which uh, makes you want to play for them even more because he they're really invested in you. So it's a good relationship. Are you able to keep up with what the Rapids are doing? Yeah, I'm in every day. So I'm there every day. Uh, I was able to go to the game. We tied 1-1 at Kansas City on Saturday. Uh, so, yeah, I'm seeing the guys every day, the coaches every day. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty integrated within the team now. I'm not training with them yet or working out with them. I'm, kind of, I'm in before those guys. I come in, I get in at 7 a.m. So I'm in a little, before, a, little, a little bit before those guys. But towards the end of my workout, they're starting to come in and stuff. So I see the guys and – we talk and then we're keeping up with each other and stuff. So yeah, it's nice. I want to know what's one of your big takeaways on how their season went. Obviously Orlando didn't go the way they wanted yeah. it to, but what's one of your big takeaways? Um, it's crazy because we had a great ending to the year uh, uh, last season with Robin coming in. And then uh, we had a good start to the season this year as well. And uh, we were undefeated. And then obviously the pandemic happened and it kind of just shut everything down and uh, kind of broke the momentum. So I think we just need to get that momentum back and kind of get back in the, the, the flow of things. And I think Orlando's kind of tough for any player to really play in. I mean, you never know what, like, it's hard to expect what to expect from certain teams in a bubble like that, where you're away from your family, you're in a hotel quarantine, you can't do anything, you can't be comfortable in your own, you know, uh, player rituals and stuff. So it's definitely different the bubble, but uh, I think uh, uh, this Saturday was a great start to get us back on track. And I think uh, towards the end of the season, towards mid-season, uh, a few games in, we're, we're really going to get it going. Well, Rachel has a, a side gig with the Colorado Rapids, and she had a chance to go to the bubble in Orlando, cover the team, and is still covering the team. Uh, what was that like, Nikki? Imagine had to be tearing you up that you weren't able to go into the bubble with your teammates. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how was that for you mentally? Um, yeah, like I said from the beginning, mentally uh, – it's really hard to break me. It's not more being away because I know at that point when I got injured, I knew my, what my role was on the team. And that was for me to be a supportive teammate and make sure whatever they need for me, they're going to get and for me to work hard on my rehabilitation and get back as soon as I can. So for me, I was super excited for the guys. Obviously, you know, I wanted to be there, but I knew I had a job I needed to get done, which is uh, to stay here and get my rehab and kind of get back and catch up so I can get back with the guys. So mentally, didn't didn't take a toll on me too much, but definitely uh, was uh, super excited to see my teammates out there because we haven't really done anything for about three months. So it was good to see. Them. You meant or you mentioned a few times how mentally tough you are. What really went on maybe in your life, or how do you feel like you gained that mental toughness? Um, I kind of think it's just been I've always just kind of played with a chip on my shoulder, even if I was like one of the best players on the team or the worst, you know, it's just like, a, it's almost a mindset. And like, for me, I think what really, really uh, got me there was like <clears throat> a lot of my uh, teammates when I played for RSL in the academy, some of them went pro out of high school and some went pro after their first year. And like, I wasn't getting that. And so like, it kind of, at first it was a little hard, but then I was like, you know what, like everyone has their own little path. And so then on top of that, all my other teammates that went to college, they went to top universities and I obviously went to Grand Canyon, which wasn't one of the biggest soccer universities in the country at the time. But um, it was kind of like, okay, well, I'm at the top university, but I'm going to show what I have, what I have, and I know it's going to be good enough. And that's, and it, it kind of rolled through professionally as well. Cause I mean, I was a 73rd pick overall in the fourth round. I had five draft picks ahead of me for the Rapids, and uh, I was the only one they signed, you know. It was just kind of a mental thing, you know. You just got to believe in yourself and know that you, you're you worth it and uh, that you're worth the investment, and that's that's always been my mindset, and it's got to be this far. So, I mean, I'm sticking with it. We're talking with Nikki Jackson, uh, currently of the Colorado Rapids, formerly of Grand Canyon University. And back in June, Nikki, you tweeted about the Black Players Coalition of the MLS. What, what is that organization and what, what are they trying, what's their message? Yeah, so uh, great question. Um, yeah, so with uh, the Black, uh, Black Lives Matter movement going on, uh, 
Jacob Blake, and George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor, and multiple other cases. But uh, really, we're just really striving to actually make change. It's a Black Players Union, basically. And I mean, there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of posting on social media, but what we're, what we're trying to do is actually make change. And uh, one of the things, I'm not sure if you saw, but uh, the boycott that happened last weekend, that was uh, started with the Black Players Union because of the Jacob Blake and everything that was going on with that. And um, we, um, I'm not sure if I'm really, I, I guess I'm allowed to say, but um, we finally have getting some, uh, some first steps in and uh, one of them was, uh, we're gonna sit down with all the owners in the league and have a really deep discussion on what we want to get out of that. Cause we didn't want that boycott to go for nothing, you know? I mean, you can do something, but if it doesn't make change, it's, it's, you're, un, you're muted, you know? So uh, we definitely, uh, we're definitely making progress and uh, a big jump, a big step was that boycott, which got a meeting with uh, all the owners in the league to talk about what we want to do financially and get, and what programs we want to get into and different things like that. So it's basically a, a union to really make change, you know? When you saw that the Rapids were boycotting that game with FC Dallas, what was your first thought about what was eventually going to happen and turn this into? Um, yeah, so that was what I was hoping. I mean, I think the first step to change is having a voice and I think and, and, and making uh, people aware. And I think that's what we did. So I don't think we had a full, full scale plan, but we wanted to get the owner's attention to get people's attention. And once you get someone's attention, then you can you can start talking and get the change, get the change and movement. But until you get that attention and that that voice that you need to be heard, nothing's going to happen. So I think that was a huge first step for us to do. And I knew once we once we grabbed the the owner's attention with with that boycott, that uh, we we're making progress and something was going to come from. Well, Nikki, certainly that that's a huge uh, huge topic and uh, very, very interesting to hear some of your thoughts on that. One of the big things happening in collegiate sports uh, this fall, anyway, yeah, we've seen the suspension of fall sports uh, pretty much across the board, with the exception <clears throat> of uh, just a few conferences. Wanted to get uh, your thoughts because there's talk of you know playing a, a spring season in uh, soccer. Uh, I don't know exactly when that would start or how yeah. long that would be, but I know in football they're saying, well, that that might not be possible because it's hard to play in the spring and then turn around and play in the fall. Wanted to get your thoughts on the, uh, the suspension of the sports and, and the possibility of men's soccer being in the spring? Um, man, it's tough. Uh, it's really tough, definitely for those seniors, because, I mean, you definitely want to get a, your, your last season in any, in any sport, or even just being in school, you know, you want to be able to be there for your last year. But uh, I think uh, most conferences took the precaution, which I understand. I do believe that there should be a spring, uh, a spring season because you, you definitely need to give those players – that uh that chance for and uh that chance for professional teams to see them because I know a lot of guys out there are trying to be a professional soccer player and having their last senior season is definitely going to help them quite a bit you know and so um I believe that the spring season is going to be should happen and uh if it does graduate in, like if it, if it does go on into the fall season fall uh fall of 2021 actually excuse me can't believe it was 2020. Uh, yeah, 2021. Um, I think that'll be good. I mean, I think we're uh, we're elite athletes, even at the college level, Division One. I. I think if you really look at a scale between professional, like the professional soccer players, we play. We start preseason in January, you know, and we go all the way through November. If you uh, if through November, you make the playoffs, but pretty much uh, January through October, which is spring and fall for uh, college. So. I see no problem with that uh, whatsoever, but I do believe that we really, they really should push for having a season for these guys. Even, uh, I'm not sure how they're going to really do the draft this year or what's gonna, what that's going to look like, but uh, at least give them a season and uh, give them a chance to get some uh, more exposure, you know? Yeah, that was uh, going to be my other question for you, Nikki, was the draft is typically in January, so yeah. those seniors you were talking about, if they have chances to play in the pros, yeah, you might have to make that decision. Are you going to play another season of college soccer, yeah. or are you going to go in the draft? Uh huh. For sure. I think. Um, I mean, it's hard to say. I graduated. I, I I wanted to make sure I was done before the draft, before it came. So I did. Uh, but it's. I mean, it's different circumstances because I had my fall season. But um, man, it's a really tough. It's a really tough discussion because 
you can look at it like both ways. You want to play your senior year, but you also want to go on the draft and stop. And you got to think about, excuse me, you got to think about <laughs> your academics and finishing school. So, I mean, it's a, t- it's a tough discussion, but I definitely do believe you should definitely give them a choice, you know, to at least if they want to play their sprint their last season, if they want to, they can. Because, I mean, not everyone's going to get in the draft. Some do just want to play, you know, and finish off their, their, their college career. So uh, definitely give them that option, that chance. Nikki, I've got one last question for you. I know you just celebrated a birthday within the last yes. week. What were you able to do? Um, uh, nothing too crazy. I went to dinner with my girlfriend. And then I actually, uh, I've been trying to, uh, she kind of surprised me. I've been trying to do one of those escape rooms, you know. Uh, have, you, have you heard of them where you, uh, they lock you in this room, you have to find different clues to get to the next room? Man, that was, I thought I was smart. That, they, that dumb <laughs> kind of room. For sure. But uh, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it for sure. So did you escape? We did. We, but we, ha- we had a few hints from the guy. I was just so embarrassed because the guy was just out here just like looked like he had this cameras and then the guy was just kind of like giving us hints. I was like, okay. And once he gave us a hint, I was like, how did I not think of that? You know, but uh, yeah, we did escape. We made it through. But uh, it, it was definitely it was definitely a challenge and a lot of fun. We're going to have to do it again for sure, though. Those are definitely tough. I guess I have one more question for you. <laughs> Who do you think will win the MLS Cup this year as long as play continues? Colorado Rapids, for sure. You love there you go. You love to <laughs> <laughs> And I have one last question for you as well, Nikki. Uh, what, at what point can we expect you to see, uh, to see you back on the pitch competitively? Um, I'll probably be healthy uh, towards, towards playoffs, but um, – I don't think I'll be probably as game fit as I should be for playoffs. So I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not in any rush. I'll be healthy. I'll be training with the guys towards the end of the season. But uh, you'll probably see me back out there in preseason. Well, Nikki, you want to again, thank you for taking some time out. Congratulations on being the number two goal scorer of the past decade. Thank in the you. WAC and want to wish you the best of luck uh, in uh, your rehab with the Colorado Rapids. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, that is Nikki Jackson coming up next. We're going to hear from Jesse Ray, who Rachel talked with a couple of weeks ago. You're listening to the WAC Podcast. Thanks for listening to the WAC Podcast. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And check out our website at WACsports.com.